looping that really. in. All right. Well, anyway, welcome back to Coach Realiterate, a one-shot edition, a podcast where four friends talk about the movies they love. I am Jake, and my fun fact is that I missed this. <laughs> yeah. We've done that bit before. <sighs> but it was funnier this time. <laughs> It's been a while. It's been, th- it's been over three months well, since we've no, recorded. It, it's funnier because I don't know if Matt's telling the truth or not. Oh, he I'm pretty sure he. I, I'm pretty no. sure he is Jake, or he, at least he thinks he's no, Jake. He might be Jake, but he definitely does not miss this. I'm still surprised I Matt was capable. All, of, I... no, Matt was capable of reading that. Can we all appreciate that? Yeah, uh, a little behind the little behind the scenes. Um, since we're just shitting on Matt for his one shots episode, (laughs) is that we were this is a Tuesday night we're recording on. We established we were recording tonight. I briefly said, "Hey, could we move to Thursday?" That very same night said, "Tuesday is fine." And then today, about forty five minutes before we're supposed to hop on, Matt goes, "Sorry guys, I can't do Thursday." (laughs) <laughs> and I wouldn't change a goddamn thing about him. Yeah, that's funny. That is funny. Uh, but yeah, I'm let's... Jake, and I've missed this. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we already heard that. <laughs> Who are you? Matt, actually... you have a fun fact about yourself, though. Me? Yeah. Well, I mean, you gave Jake's introduction, so did you want to actually introduce yourself? No, that was my introduction. Oh, okay. So, well, okay. Oh, Are there any other Jake's I should know about? All right, well, Sean. You're not ready. Go ahead, then. You're not ready yet. Wait, why am I going next? Why is this so out of... This is out of order, damn it. That's not out of order. It's not out of order. Plus, we can you go after me. Out of order. Go after me. Sean, we've been off the air for three months. There is no order to things anymore. There's no order never matter. Y'all are so stuck up on the order. The there is only order. No, Sean is stuck Jake, up on the order. Jake I don't get two Matt, shits. Sean. So since Matt started to go order. Sean to Jake to Jason, so Sean goes next. <laughs> here, here, Does here's that not a make fucking Someone sense go. to everybody? You Someone go. Assholes? Uh, Sean, go. So, uh, my name's, uh, Sean. Uh, it, I'm pretty sure about that one. I, I, I thought about it real long and hard, and I'm pretty sure my name's Sean. Uh, my fun fact is, um, I, I can't remember any of the fun facts I gave, like, beforehand anymore because it's been too long, so I feel like I'm gonna, I feel like I'm gonna accidentally retread one of them, but, uh, my thing is gonna be that I hate VTubers, uh, I... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I, th- I think uh they shouldn't exist and they should burn in a fire i love the idea of being able to hide your face while streaming but oh my god vtubers should die it's it, it the from what i observed as an outsider uh perspective i feel like they breed a poor fan base <laughs> it's, it's I, uh, My Matt, biggest gripe. Matt and I would know. Poor or whore? Huh? What? Did you say poor or whore? Poor. <laughs> no, if they if they cultivated a horror fan base, I'd love them. <laughs> no, I, poor. I, I, and, I, and, I, I just to I, be clear. I just didn't. Way, I just didn't hear you. To be absolutely clear, I don't mean financially poor. I mean like poor. Well, like, I don't like. If you spend like six hundred dollars for it to say her name or something, you're they probably might be financially poor. But I don't care that they're financially poor. And like, also, that's not that a does fault of a person. Yeah, that has nothing to do with them as a person. So like I, you know, anywho. Although to be so fair, I'm they just... are probably they are probably oh, financially shit. poor with all those tier three subs they've been giving. <laughs> Dude. You just missed the whole conversation that we just had. <laughs> he said they're spending six hundred dollars to hear them say their name. They're probably poor. <laughs> and then he said, "Yeah, with all those tier three subs." All I'm saying is Matt got real specific. A little different, but <laughs> I was about to say there's more. It's it's a, it's more specific that only Sean will get. Look. All right. Well, I'm Jeff. Oh, Hi Jeff. Hi Jeff. How are you doing? You're Larry. I'm J- I'm Jason, and uh, I'm the Liam Gallagher of the oh. podcast. And oh. and 
given that I just said that, if you're wondering if I'm excited about Oasis reuniting... Oh, God. Boy, am I. Do I currently have two Oasis vinyl records within 20 feet of me? Yes, I do. Do I adore Oasis? Yes, I do. Have I listened to them the past two, few days since they announced their reunion? Absolutely. I love Oasis, bro. Um, so I can't believe I never thought I'd see the day that Noel and Liam Gallagher were like taking pictures together again. There's a picture of them together. Y'all gotta read some text I got from Jason about this. Oh, I told I gotta you that I would have been genuinely mad, and I would have been. Well, if you well, were I'm not even just thinking about. I'm not even just thinking about that. I sent Jason text. I saw so Patrick Willems, who I know I've referenced as a person, like a creator filmmaker i'm a fan of before on loves oasis and i found out through his twitter that they were back together immediately While checked the jason I was at Gallagher's a made up. show <laughs> so jason's happy the next day jason texts me i want you to know that if you had been fucking with me i would have been genuinely mad <laughs> um i would have been and then, i was and, thinking about that <laughs> but then later on this is this was yesterday um this is where it gets good jason texts me imagine if we because jason and i for any potential new listeners or brothers. Imagine if we didn't speak for 15 years and I called you a potato on Twitter and that whole t- that whole time and then we started the podcast again. So I'm really appreciative of Jason putting the like level of cultural importance that this podcast of 200 followers has um on the same level of Oasis. Hell yeah. Well, but I, like I said uh, to you, we're a group with two brothers in it. That's the natural comparison we should have expected. Yeah. So I just I just wanted y'all to know know about that. That we're Oasis. No, I literally was I was thinking about it. Like if you had texted me like, oh, I was in a terrible accident. I'm in the hospital. And then while I was on the way to the hospital, told me it was a prank. I'd be upset. But if you brought it up later in life, I'd be like, yeah, that was pretty funny. If you had been lying about Oasis reuniting. Uh, and you brought it up later, I'd be like, that shit's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So, well, aren't you glad I didn't lie? Yes. <laughs> like, I would have gotten to Ireland trip, and see him, Jace. I, w- I, was, I was daydreaming about taking a trip to Ireland just the other day. Maybe we should go. One day, if we have enough money. Oh, Matt's inviting himself. <laughs> Matt, does, Matt is completely unaware of the fact, dude, in two days we're going to get a text from Matt that he's like, did you guys hear Oasis got back together? <laughs> they haven't talked in Oh, I learned before you guys. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Because I tweeted about it yesterday because I said that they should um, bring out a dummy of Damon Albarn from Blur and hang him on stage. <laughs> Purely for theatrics and artistical, you know, you know because they have beats. Guys, can I talk about the arena ball? Do you think listeners think we bully Matt? Yes. <laughs> I think we do. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> but I love Matt. I love Matt, too, but I think we bully him, too. Guys, let's let's have a vote between the four of us. Do we bully Matt? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, think it's, I think we all bully each other. I agree. No. <laughs> no. I absolutely bully all of you. Well, uh, I'd say mostly Jason Jake. has never given a single fuck about speaking his mind to me. I think we should bully Matt more. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just can't wait for the first concert to oh. get canceled. Just from Oasis t- tell- telling each other that they're bellends. And then getting into an argument. No, and they're, then, they're, 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 they're more the, creative they're, than they're the bellends, right bro. There. They're more creative than that. They <laughs> did you see, like fucking Noel Gallagher was asked about Maddie Healy in an interview and he called him a slack jawed fuckwit. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're gonna disagree with me, but I hate Maddie Healy. I know, I know you do. <laughs> oh. I'm uh, 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 calling him that. I'm just gonna try to move on because I shouldn't wait. No, no. Uh, Jake wants to talk about arena ball, so let's talk about arena ball. We always open with like wrecks and stories. Yeah, uh, we got we've got like 
over three months of time between we last recorded. I mean, I know we all see each other often, but I just I, think I think people. But they don't know that. They don't know that. See, the people don't know that. For yes, all they, they know, most of our listeners know us personally, so they know that. And the ones that don't, why would we not want them to know that we're actually friends? Because of drama. Because <laughs> it's true. You want them to think we actually like don't like each other? Yeah. I want you to say. I want to point out that Sean literally had a made a point of recommending us as friends in one of these episodes. Yeah, I and, know. And and now Matt's like, no, no one has any idea that we're friends. Who's <laughs> <laughs> in, in my head? <laughs> but they sure don't know that. We could just be like, that we're friends. we could just be like podcast friends, not real life friends. <laughs> okay, and I think we've I'm, established. I'm gonna shatter that illusion because I need to talk about going to a championship level sporting event in a New Jersey mall with Matt. <laughs> Why? So what? What? You you cuz I'm going to say this and you're going to not remember anything, I think. Probably not. Um so I am a big fan of I the niche know sport. I told you this story bef- like told this story with you around before Matt. So you should know why it involves you. <laughs> well, this, so the, well you, it involves him because he was there. Well, I no, mean, I know. Like, but like, so I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of the niche sport of arena football slash indoor football. Arena's better. The difference is it has rebound nets and they're fun. Um, Google it. Uh, so I had the opportunity to go to. The sport is in a really weird place. They held the championship game, the Arena Bowl in a mall in New Jersey. I had the opportunity to go with it. Jason was busy, but Sean and Matt went with me. Really, right off the bat, really weird but cool atmosphere. Just side note, I I, I want to make it so crystal clear. I love Matt so much. And these things are largely good. Because <laughs> we're just yeah, talking so about pulling Matt. Can, can we pull Matt some more? I'm lo- I'd love to hear it. <laughs> And you know what, Sean and Matt interject if you have a di- if you experience things differently. <laughs> but for my, we get to we get to this mall, and immediately Matt is asking me questions about where things are. I've been there exactly as long as him. <laughs> um, and, and the most pressing thing is, Matt, you made the decision to not eat at all before leaving. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and we get in, and you're really hungry. So, like, the first thing is to, like, find you food. I stop. I, I love a soft pretzel. I love a pretzel dog. It's Wetzel's Pretzels. I stop, at the, I stop there to get a pretzel dog. And I'm like, Matt's standing in line with me. I assume Matt's getting something. I ask Matt, and Matt's like, no, nah, I need something more substantial. Fair enough. You haven't eaten all day. Why he's standing in line with me to not get food when he's starving, I don't know. Um... So now, from my point of view, the mission is find Matt food. But Matt keeps wanting to stop and look at Gundam. <laughs> um, I do remember that. <laughs> Gundam. And, and then eventually, I mean, I'm I'm comp- I'm shortening because it's been a little bit, and because eventually we need to get onto the episode. But the next step is we we get to an area where there seems to be a bunch of food upstairs and i'm like matt there's all these restaurants there's all these signs listed let's go upstairs and look and matt you were so insistent that it was only sit down restaurants and me and sean if i recall sean was trying to get us to go upstairs i was trying to get us to go upstairs and you were like and this is this is how selfless matt is though matt knew knew i wanted to go into the lego store and he's like no let's look at legos (laughs) <laughs> I mean, Matt, you haven't eaten all day. You're just a kid, but you want to look at Legos. Yeah. And, and because that's the type of friend Matt is. So we go look at Legos instead of giving this poor child food. Poor but child. Also, <laughs> Matt, that's also Matt. Up, by the way. <laughs> I know. He's fucking older than me. Also, you were so sure that there was only sit-down restaurants upstairs. And I'm not sure why, because you were also always asking me where things were. I. It was very interesting to me. Eventually, we get Matt to go upstairs, and sure enough, there is food, and not only a sit-down restaurants. And the first thing Matt asks about getting is a corn dog. Now, if you recall from earlier in the story, a pretzel dog wasn't substantial enough for Matt. But you don't understand. It was a Korean corn dog. But then the, no, but then the other thing that's weird about it to me is you didn't just want to get a corn dog. 
You walked up to Sean and said, "Hey, Sean, do you want to split a corn dog with me?" Oh, yeah, it was <laughs> fuck splits not... a corn dog. And how? Like that's so that's not, not conducive. more erotic than Top Gun. <laughs> that's not conducive to splitting at all. I you on a stick. That's what you really, really bothers me. Between your mouth. <laughs> but that that was my favorite and part. Eat, and you haven't eaten all day, and you want to have half a corn dog? That was that was my favorite part. The idea of me sharing a wiener with Matt. What could be more sensual between friends? No, Matt. I don't. To me, the piece de resistance of this experience, which is, a, inc- I had a great time with you guys. Loved it. I want to do it again next year if we can. Is and I don't know if you recall this, but the game's about to start. We're like we're right up next to the field, right? Because it's in a fucking mall, so everything's like front row seats. You could reach out and touch a player when they're standing in the end zone. There is a player on the Billings Outlaws, number four. I don't remember his last name. Oh, my God. I I don't know why he stood out to you, Matt. But they're they're getting ready for the opening kickoff. And you look at me and go, who's number four? And I was like, I don't know. This may not have been his last name. I don't remember. His his last name is Johnson. And I'm like, I I don't know what I'm supposed to say about this person. And you go, hey, four! Hey, four! And you should be yelling at this guy that's like at a fucking arm's reach away. And I was mortified because my things, and this is, and again, this is reflective of me because what, no, I mean, I stand by that was weird as fuck, but I am such an anxious person. So I am like going to shit myself as you yell at this. I'm like, and I have no idea. Like, if you could explain to me, if you recall, what was going through your mind that you were yelling at this man. <laughs> it was so, and I, why him? Why did he stand out to you? You also really liked it was really cheap metal bleachers, and I'm thinking about this in the moment that we were on, and you really liked rocking on those fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> and you just made my life so fun, man. <laughs> Thank you. Uh... But if you can even just put the slightest amount of insight into why you were obsessed with the man who was number four. I think I think if I remember correctly, when I asked Matt why he did that, he told me he wanted to say good luck to like to him for the oh, game. Oh yeah, that that was I was going to do <laughs> that. You guys cut off for me. What happened? So I basically yeah. So basically, why I just wanted to call out to him, and then if he like turned to me, I'll just say, "Hey, good luck out there," and that was really it. <laughs> and that's and that's so sweet. That is so that's fucking so sweet. But I was like, sh- I was like, oh my god. Hey, <laughs> so just like, like I, 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 this is the British version. Friends and family that listen, man. If you want the full version, I can give it to you. So I'm like, I literally like could not believe my eyes. Mm-hmm. I will. I, love I will. That. I will also I, remember. I can't, like, I'm not sure selling how close we were. Like we could literally, like we were probably like a step away from being able to reach out and touch the guy. And I was a little afraid that Matt was going to. <laughs> the whole thing was so much fun. Like I love the game. I will also always remember that at the end of it, in like the weirdest possible way of this being like a fever dream of a day, we sat in uh, to get food afterwards, like after the game, and we were sitting right next to a window in front of like it's the middle of summer in the northeast of the United States, and we're sitting in front of a window that's a skiing the ski hill covered in fake snow. <laughs> indoors and that's, and that, that's the other thing that comes from that is matt we were at like a <laughs> bar pub type place and matt got jambalaya <laughs> I which i place. love because he's probably the first person in five years to order jambalaya from there and you said it was good and it looked good but i feel like 99 percent of the orders are probably burgers or tacos and then also fun fact about matt because he didn't give one he just said he was me matt drinks water like a motherfucker <laughs> oh, your father was astounded. Your your father was honestly worried for me. No, because I, you you would have thought you'd been in the desert for three weeks. Like you sat down and just guzzled a glass of water. They came back and felt solid again. But you're kind of always like that. And it's water is like the only thing you really drink because you don't like fizz. You don't like alcohol. You don't like fizz. You don't really do caffeine. 
But like you just it's just another way that you are like one of a kind in the best way. But it's you have to have drank wine. like how do you not get water poisoning? You like, you know you, you can gotta die drink, from drinking too much water. Water poisoning even a real water thing. Yes. Yeah, you can drink, you yeah, drink too much water and die. You have to drink so much water to I Yeah, I know, but Jason, I'm not kidding you. It was like it's every thirty like, seconds he was downing a glass. No, you it gotta drink sad. like a pitcher every thirty seconds though. I feel like Matt can yeah, do it. A, it's an absurd <laughs> amount of water. Can do it. I don't know the exact numbers. I'm not saying a pitcher every 30 seconds. I'm being hyperbolic, but... Oh, one of my favorite moments about that night was um, I remember trying to like look up stuff about the arena football game, and then uh, I think it was like a, a barstool tweet, and it ho- showed a clip of how the arena football league championship game was being played inside the mall it showed a clip of the kicker and you could clearly see me and sean in the background yeah. <laughs> and i'm like <laughs> sean was wearing his glasses too and then oh, because yeah. we were standing in the bleachers we stood out we looked like we were seven feet tall men <laughs> oh, oh it was great time. That was a great time. The best part was that we sat in the uh, the wrong section because we were supposed to be sitting in the billing section, but we sat in the Albany section. Wow. We were, we were with the ops. Yeah, we were with the Everyone in our section fans. would cheer when we booed and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. You were having like a... Albany. You were having like a nice like back and forth one to Albany fans. Oh yeah, there's a couple people like right by us who were super nice. Um, oh, they were. It was like nice trash nice. talk. It wasn't like the do nasty. Kind yeah, of no, they they were super nice. It was friendly trash talk. It was a great, great crowd. Um, I just wish. Yeah, that I, I mall wasn't in the football. middle of a fucking highway. I want to go back to it though, because they got like a whole ass theme park and water park in there. It's pretty sick. I know. It has I'll Shrek. show you a water park. I'll show you a water. Park. It has Shrek, so. Um, Oh That's god, it, I love Shrek. Shrek is love. Anyway, any Rex, anybody? Is Wonderwall? Oh, yeah, yes, I have um, Rex. I got a shit ton. Who's Rex? Go first. It's, your, it's your time to shine. Me, well, me and you have the same Rex. I'm looking at your list right now. Uh, so I put that I put that one on there because I thought it would surprise you and Sean. Did I you know see what it? You, well, okay, well, let me get obviously, to it first. Yes, so, so, obviously, it. Obviously, so obviously my Rex is Ultraman Rising. Because I love Ultraman, and when so I good. first saw this, when I first saw the trailer release, I was immediately in love because the art style looked incredible, the animation looked incredible, and it blew all my expectations. And I already had high ones. It just, it looks incredible. the The story is absolutely adorable, and I love love what they do with the uh with like the Tokusatsu like the Ultraman formula and they kind of twist that around. So um like a perfect example, I'll only name one because if I try to name everything, this will be a podcast in itself and we'll no, never no, get to no, Mad no, Max no, no, Matt. Matt, name everything. Everything, Matt. Do it right now. Uh first off, um shut the fuck up. Hey yo. Second uh, so, the thing about Ultraman is that usually there is an attack team that usually helps him during the fights, but they're really useless. In uh, this movie, they instead make him more of like an antagonistic role. They're still good guys in the realm of Ultraman, but they're in opposition to him. So basically, in this in Ultraman Rising's world, they uh, kill all the uh, kaiju that, in, of course, con- uh, tried to destroy Japan. And Ultraman's role is to be like a mediator to protect Japan, but at the same time, you know, uh, save these monsters. And so it's like, you know, it's like an interesting twist on the formula because they're not useless. They are a threat but in like a different kind of way than the kaiju are like they're not going to destroy japan but they're still in opposition with ultraman and i love how like they intertwine between like the kaiju 
uh, the uh, the attack team and Ultraman. But that's it. That's all I'm going to mention. Watch it. I'm going to double down on that wreck because it's also because it's more accurate where the LA Dodgers, even with the best baseball player of all time on an all-lady loaded roster who is literally a superhero, cannot win a legitimate ring. Just doubling down on that wreck. It was it was great. I will I will also triple down. I loved it so much. It was so good. Oh, yeah, I watched I it with Sean. It out. Yeah, I watched Aww. it with Sean, and I was so happy that I was able to see his first reaction because I already saw it. I saw it on a re- uh, release day, and it was so I was so happy to see Sean enjoy the. Movie. Yeah, I saw I, I saw Sean's letterbox review, and that's how I knew it existed. Um, and I was like, I should watch that because I. I, you know, I like to watch shit my friends like and be able to talk to you about it. Um, the one thing that made me so, I thought it came out like a while ago, and apparently I was wrong. And I guess this is what happens when Netflix is the one releasing things and there's no marketing whatsoever. But uh, yeah, I, I remember seeing the trailers like a while ago, and I thought it came out like a while ago too. But I, I finally got to see it. I will appreciate that. God, I loved it so much. It's so gorgeous. I want to also recommend, I'll, I'll be rapid fire because there's a lot, anyone but you, Hitman, and Twisters, and really just anything with Glenn Powell, movie star shit. I saw the TV glow, saw that with Sean, has one of the most impacting films I've seen in a long time, one of the most haunting shots of the year for me in any movie, and I, if you watch that movie and you are still hateful to people with different gender identities there's something broken in you um the bike riders love actors doing weird voices and that's got like three of them uh babes really funny comedy really heartwarming like mini rom-com within the like start of it great movie really fun time oddity saw that with sean too great 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 original horror uh trap big fan of trap um a lot of y'all didn't get the vision with it but it's really good and josh hartnett is amazing thelma really fun comedy that's gonna make you want to talk to your grandparents um really funny really sweet and lastly uh off the beaten path recommendation for me the song sudden to me s-u-n by zach bryan oh that's a good song beautiful song beautiful song good songwriter know much about him i frankly i heard the song because i'm one of like four people on the planet that will openly say i enjoy machine gun kelly um a lot of y'all are lying because he does fucking numbers um but he covered that and the cover's good too but then i listened to the original and i was just it's beautiful so he yeah zach, to that. zach bryan is a very very good songwriter i'll have to listen to more of his music i'm not like really in my country folk Me, the americana game often i'm not really either but i am into the good songwriting game it's fair enough that but that that's I'm, I'm backing away now that's that's my piece um i have a lot of music related rex a band called candy released an album called it's inside of you i believe is the title let me double check that pause uh yeah it's inside you by candy they're a hardcore band they're sick they're like they incorporate like electronic elements which is really cool and i like that a lot makes them a little different and then also similarly another hardcore band uh that's called candy apple the other band's called candy this band's called candy apple uh they have an album called Comatose that came out this year that is so fantastic. Uh, it has a song called Dying Artist Dead Format, which is one of my favorite like hardcore-related songs that I've heard in a while. Um, so it's awesome. And so, yeah, if you're into... No, you know what? I always say if you're into hardcore or if you're into metalcore type shit, just listen to it. Enjoy something. Find something new you like, you know? Not just if you're into that. Just listen to it, you know? Candy, Candy Apple. Also, Charlie XCX's new new album, which is, like, pretty, you know, it's been out for a while by the time this comes out. Because uh, we had our, it came out during our hiatus. But it's fantastic. If you haven't heard it, if somehow, listen to it. Bootyful. 
I have I have one rec, and the only reason I'm recommending it now is just because of when this will probably release, and also because I've been thinking about it a little bit. But I, I don't know if I recommend this before or if anybody has recommended it earlier. Um, so I'll take it a little step further. But uh, for those who haven't seen it, Over the Garden Wall, uh, it's it's beautiful. I love the animation, and all of it is fantastic. Uh, and I have two suggestions past that. Um, the guy who did a lot of the art direction and art for the backgrounds of the show, uh, Nick Cross, has a YouTube channel, so I'd recommend watching his animated shorts because he does a lot of interesting things, and some of them are really creepy, uh, like one I believe is called Clockwork Elves. That one disturbs me. Uh, and taking that a step further with the uh for anybody who likes the music over the garden wall i recommend listening to the band the blasting company uh because they're the ones who (laughs) they are the ones who did all of the music for over the garden wall they do a lot of like american folksy stuff but a lot of it's like super interesting they also released in 2020 like an album of all the songs that they did that they wrote and didn't include in over the garden wall uh which wasn't too big i think it was only like six songs or something and one of them was like i've been listening to one of them on repeat because it was really creepy and it's called like the tithing man uh but it's about like what the beast in the show was originally supposed to be and how there is like apparently more of a backstory not backstory but more of like context to him and like what he does other than like turning people into trees uh they have like he was supposed to have sharp teeth and there was like parts of it where he was supposed to be like killing children and whittling down their bones uh so, <laughs> so i can only imagine how I did, how creepy originally over the garden wall was uh so yeah i recommend those three things i guess i thought you were gonna say infinity train when you said over the garden wall but there's more oh god but i'd also recommend infinity train but i don't think anybody's able to watch that without watching it illegally either way i'd still do that because that's the only way you can support it It maybe the best thing you've ever shown me um that honestly that or over the garden wall over the garden wall is so good God, I, um, I need to watch it again with fall coming up. Warner Bros. We should watch it together, guys. Dick. Sure, why not? No, I'm busy. Okay. And then we can make potatoes and molasses together. <laughs> potatoes and molasses. It's it's from the show. It's a it's a song from the show. That's one of those shows that like I've seen, oh, so, just I've asking. seen, but I haven't seen. You know what I mean? We got some over the garden wall art on my in my apartment that uh Priya got at a Comic Con. Um, anyway. We can finally talk about the movie <laughs> that we've been not talking about for the last 30 minutes. Oh, we're only doing one movie now? Go jump off a bridge. Okay. Anyway, um, we're going to be talking about both Furiosa and Mad Max Fury Road. So, um, I'm not sure how we're going to be able to do this because we never really covered two movies in one episode before. But you know what? Fuck it. Let's just give it a try. So, um, both Furiosa and Mad Max were both directed by George Miller, legend, living legend. Please direct at least one more movie before you die. Uh, and um, <laughs> give me more entertainment before you die. I know this is now. I know what it feels like to be a Game of Thrones fan. Like this is this is my Game of Thrones. Please finish it before you die. <laughs> Oh God! But uh, it, both movies are also direct, uh, written by uh, George Miller and what was that say, Nick Lathuris? Your guess is as good as mine, buddy. That's how I would say. All right, and Brendan McCarthy is also getting a writing writing credit in Fury Road. And I'm just gonna read the rest of this. Uh, Fury Road was shot by Simon uh, Dugan, and Fury was shot by so- John Seal. The cast of this duology includes. Uh, Anya Taylor-Joy as Furiosa, Chris Hemsworth as Dementis, uh, <laughs> Tom Burke as Praetorian Jack, oh my god, Al- Alia Bow Brow as Childhood Furiosa, 
Nathan Jones as Rictus. Oh my god, what are these I names? Lachy Rectus. Hol- oh yeah, oh sorry, it's Rectus. Lacti Holm as a Morton Joe. Josh Hellman as Scrotus. Charlie <laughs> Frazier as Mary Jabasa. Tom Hardy as uh, Mad Max. Uh, Ch- Charlie Thor- Theron? Oh my god, how do you pronounce yep. the name, Dan? Charlie's Her Theron. Famous, Charlie's the Theron. The most famous one is the one he's like, Charlie's oh? Theron. <laughs> Who? <laughs> Charlie <laughs> Thespian? <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> as Furiosa, Hugh Keys by, uh, Byron as in Morton Joe, Nicholas Holt as uh, um, Nux. I'm just going through it. I'm just going to go through this. <laughs> I'm not even going to try that one. I'm not even going to try uh, that one. Riley Co. Riley Co. is capable. And even more, we got to cut it off somewhere. Well, I was going to cut it off earlier, but whatever. All right. You don't want to give the special shout out? Uh, Where? You don't want to acknowledge Iota as the doof warrior? <laughs> oh, yeah. You shout out to Iota. <laughs> I wrote the cutoff part, and then I was like, oh my god, we gotta talk about the Doof Warrior. <laughs> well, you shouldn't put that before the cutoff, because I was actually going to cut off there. Hey, you write it next time. Okay. Alright, but first we're going to talk about Furiosa. <laughs> so, just going to read like a basic, basic synopsis, and then we can just talk about the movie. So, as the world fell, young Furiosa is snatched from the green place of many mothers and falls into the hands of a great biker horde. Led by the uh, led by the warlord Dementis, S- sweeping through the wasteland, they come across the citadel presided over by Immortan Joe. While the two tyrants war for dominance, Furiosa must survive many trials as she puts together the means to find her way home. So, this movie was much more different. Was much different than I was anticipating. I was kind of anticipating it being similar to Mad Max, about it being just constant action but what i instead got was a very artful character study and i love the way it's structured it kind of reminds me of like the odyssey like homer's odyssey where like there's like each movies are literally divided by chapters of separate moments of her life and uh we start by seeing her at the green place and it's honestly great to see it because um, what's great about watching Furiosa and Mad Max back to back is that you get to understand more of Furiosa's loss. Like, for example, um, in the Mad Max, when she realized that the green place has been decimated and has been basically turned into a poison water hole, she basically has like, she just broke down and starts crying. And this movie basically gives more context to that and shows you what a beautiful place it actually is. It's beautiful. Like, its trees are everywhere. There's fruit growing everywhere. And unfortunately, some bikers found it. And uh, I guess they snatched Furiosa up because they want proof of the existence of the green place. And Sorry, it's Man. been a while since like we watched the movie, so it's, I'm tr- I'm trying to recall right now. That's your fault for not being free, Matt, or answering texts, I should say. <laughs> yeah, but I also wasn't free. I was very busy, Sean. Busy. Matt's a hot commodity. Matt was busy busy Scrotus thinking and about Rectus. Scrotus and Rectus. We'll get to Scrotus and Rectus in a minute. But as for I love, I love Scrotus and Rectus though. I'm so sad. Uh, Scrotus doesn't really make it to the second film. Well, not you know, second you, film, but the first film. You, but you second also film forgot, chronologically. You also forgot to list when you were talking about the actors. You didn't list all of the Dementuses. See, I was going to get oh, to yeah, that. Dark, but I didn't want to spoil Dementus it, Sean. Dementus. Spoiler! <laughs> you know what? Fuck it. I'm, I'm just going to go loose. I'm just going to go all loose. This movie is incredible. Free ball it. Exactly, I'm going to free ball. This movie is incredible. No. And it's sh- it's shot, it's so beautifully shot. And it takes a lot more time. It takes a lot more like of its time compared to Mad Max. While Mad Max is like a nonstop action thriller, Fury also takes his time. And it actually has some quiet moments, which is very appreciated. 
because um it's more of like a contrast going from one to the other but they somehow fit together like a seamless puzzle. And I gotta give a shout out to Anya Taylor-Joy. She is incredible as Furiosa. Like, those eyes speak volumes. It's not just because they're big. Like, she, she uh, speaks through them. It's not just because they're big. And she, um, what was her name again? Charlie's Th- Theron? Charlie's Theron. Oh my god, Charlie's why Theron. is the one person that Matt can't... Do? I don't know, but she but she impersonates Charlie's Theron, especially at the end, absolutely fall- flawlessly. And yeah, like she she embodies the baddest character of Fiorosa to a T. In fact, I'm not sure if I like uh, Mad Max version or the Furiosa version better because they're both badasses. But yeah, I, l- I love these two movies. I w- want to know what your guys' thoughts on both movies are. I For a second, I thought he was about to say she embodies the baddest bitch. <laughs> Wait, why would you think I would say that? Because it sounded like you were okay. saying the baddest She's giving first. mother. I thought you she, She's just embodying the baddest bitch. Um, <laughs> well, anyway, uh, beyond my, my, How's uh, your sex life? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't that funny, I just really wasn't expecting it. <laughs> I know. Anyway, I, um, I had never seen a Mad Mac before. Mad Mac? Yeah, that's the singular form. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> I'd never seen a Mad Mac film before. So, um, I, so I kind of, like, assumed, having never seen the movies, that they were just kind of, like, I don't know, like, Hunger Games-ish. I've never seen the Hunger Games either. <laughs> so I don't really know what I mean by that. <laughs> But to me, so you're talking out of your ass. It, to me, it made sense. I just looped them in the same category. They're um, both dystopian. Yeah. I think my only real association with Mad Max was like, I knew of the movies, obviously. And I think there was like a Rick and Morty episode that was like Mad Max inspired, if I remember correctly. Fuck Justin Roiland is piece of shit ass but <laughs> but uh some of the show it was kind of funny i don't know i've seen it um so yeah i didn't know what to expect going into this so i was kind of just like oh they'll be fun action movies and we watched furiosa first because we watched this all together because we're cute um uh we watched furiosa first and it was Obviously, it was, like, very action-packed. There was a lot of action and great action at that. But it was uh, similar to how Matt was surprised at how character-driven it was and it wasn't so action-based. I literally only knew of these movies as, like, oh, Tom Hardy in it, action movie, dystopian. Uh, So I was kind of expecting it to be more... I don't know, the way I heard these guys talking about it it just kind of seemed like i don't know like dystopian fast and furious in a sense and it kind of was that a little bit (laughs) but artsy but like artsy yeah like you said like like really strong characters though like furios is a really strong character uh in the sense that she's like literally physically badass and strong and the fact that it's just like a well-made character hi priya i see priya in the background <laughs> um just got home priya. Sorry, i just got distracted by my brother's fiance because you are that sounded really bad hey, <laughs> i fucking watch it buddy that. yo pause myself <laughs> are you sure it was priya and not his backup fiance oh that's me. I'm the back of fiance. That was pre-recording. You cannot reference a joke that was pre-recording. I do have that on my. We do what we want here. It's not when this video was recording, bitch. 
We're recording a video now? Yeah, it's on the Patreon at, uh... <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But yeah, so I was pleasantly surprised to, you know, when we started Furiosa and how, uh... How it really chronicled such a good character arc of a well-made character and a great performance. You already mentioned the performance by Anya Taylor-Joy, but she's a great actor in her own right, and she, this is no exclusion. She was fantastic in this. I, yeah, she was. I can also speak similarly to Jason. I had prior to not seeing any Mad Max movies at all. I still have only seen Furiosa and Fury Road. Um, but I saw Furiosa first in theaters, uh, which it's a shame that both of these movies did not do well in theaters, and I feel like they deserved better. Dude, uh, I and I'm part of the problem. I should have seen both of these fucking things in theaters, and I did it. God fucking damn it. Uh... <laughs> I mean, I saw Furiosa in theaters. That counts for something. I didn't well, see Mad yeah, Max. Good for because... you. I didn't. I'm a piece <laughs> of shit. What do you want from me? Uh, but <laughs> I guess it was interesting to go from Furiosa to Mad Max more in the situation of I went into Furiosa without any of the context and went into Mad Max with context as opposed yeah. to the opposite way. <laughs> uh, and I still love both. They're still yeah. both fantastic i it, it is a little bit funny because it's kind of like i went into it it was like a little bit of whiplash i went into it expecting like pure action and then i was like oh like that was a lot of action and and really well-made action but it, it was also like really character driven like i said and then you go to fury road which isn't necessarily character driven uh and is a lot more leaning towards the action movie kind of prototype, I guess. Archetype is a better word, not prototype. Um, though it's not to say it's run-of-the-mill in any way, because I don't think it is. But you're right, it, it, it's kind of like, oh, this is the expectation I had, but now it's like after I got the expectations of Furiosa. I... I will say that my my favorite character throughout this whole thing is still Dementis. <laughs> he's such yeah. a piece. Shout, of out, shit. shout out to Dementis, man. He's so good, but he's such a piece of shit. Or, sorry, I should say <laughs> my favorite is Dark Dementis. Uh, he is uh, my favorite Dementis. I like. Uh, I'm more of a Dementis. I, I'm more of a red Dementis guy. I just yeah. like that pop of color. Yeah. <laughs> okay. For I those love... people who don't that, know. That's the one that's one he is when his nipples are bleeding, right? When he when I he bargains so. with no, the Norton show, that was red. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. that that's because that's for my money. That's the best event to see. Is that mm -hmm. whole him spinning the yarn about young Furios? Because I the thing I didn't expect was that the first like almost half of this movie Anya Taylor Joy is not in, and it's just the child version of Furiosa, who, which is also true. But it's but it doesn't like dr like it'd be so easy for something like that to drag. But like yeah. the kid who plays her, is, I don't know, we mentioned earlier, is also, fucking fantastic. Yeah, for sure. It, it, her it, mom's and, a badass too. And I'll too. say that that feels like a very artistic choice because I feel a lot of big movies would want to push the star as much as they could. I mean, like, on top of that, it has an interesting idea when you look at all, all both, I shouldn't say all, all two movies. Both all of two these, of these. All two of these movies. Uh, that, like, it, it, it's interesting to see it from the perspective of, like, the beginning of, the beginning half of Furiosa is, like, about her as a kid, and then the second half of Furiosa is her as, like, I don't know how old she's supposed to be there, but I'm just going to assume teenager somewhere around that. If not older, probably older. Uh, and then Mad Max is her as an adult, so you're getting three parts of her life fully in there. So it's kind of just, like, following her the whole time when you combine them together. But, like, yeah, the first part of it had such a possibility of, like, falling into the trap of a... Uh... Usually when you bring in, like when you try to show a character in like a flashback like where it's you have a younger actor playing the character it's just to like 
se- it's just set up and that's it. Uh, and this didn't fall out fall up into the trap of being just set up. It's like an entire continuous story showing her from beginning to end, child to adult, uh, throughout the course of the two movies. So I just love that, like, I I didn't get what I expected, and it wasn't exactly what I was hoping for, but I loved it all the same. It does feel like a like a old Greek hero tale, right? As in, like, it's not like super dense. It's kind of dramatic. It's like it's pretty failed. tragic, but it's it's just so wonderfully shot. I can't stop talking about how wonderfully shot it is, especially um one scene in particular was when uh was it like Vitor- was when it Chris when... Hemsworth gets his nipples ripped off. No, that was, Jack. that was Vitorian Jack and uh, Furiosa attempt to flee. To Furiosa's uh, home with the Mentis on their tail. That chase scene was absolutely incredible. And it wasn't even like fast paced. It was pretty like the camera was pretty like drawn out so you could see everything. But it was just so tense, especially with dark Dementis chasing them <laughs> in a humongous monster truck. And I love like I love the sound and designs of these movies. I love how powerful the cars feel. Like you when the engines roar, they roar. Like you feel it when they accelerate. And it's incredible. The the action is also incredible. For Furiosa, my favorite fight scene is the the bullet farm scene. The bullet farm fight scene is freaking amazing. Because you get uh Praetorian Jack trying to cause like a distraction with the Warwick. And that thing just goes down in a blaze of glory, man. Literally. And you see Furiosa having like being this like this sniper sniping all of the uh uh the Mentis's men. And <sighs> the thing is about these movies is that they just leave me speechless. I can't describe how I feel about them, but they are incredible. My and the thing is just that there's so much personality to these uh to these characters as well, especially Dementis. Oh, we're gonna be met- talking about Dementis a lot. Because um Dementis that dude is one of the most charismatic, yet like he's like a guy whose tail is always between his legs, especially when he turns to Dark Dementis. Like the scene in the bullet farm. One of my favorite things is he constantly asks his men to check where Furiosa's positions are. And he, he I think he, it took two men's heads before someone was actually able to figure out where she was. And then he uses another one as a meat shield so he could shoot a rocket launcher at her. The dude is such a piece of shit. And I love it. He's such a lovable villain. And Chris Hemsworth. So honestly, like the image of Thor was so prevalent in my head when I came into this movie, and that was like kicked out immediately because he knocks it out of the park. I love how he transitions between all three of his Dementis phases. Like I won't even say like when we see him first, I'll he's like Dementis. I'll say he's like white Dementis because how he calls himself is by his color, and he's dressed in all white when you first see him. So that's white Dementis. And then um, he gets shot. No, he doesn't get shot, but someone shoots like one of those red fireworks nearby and he gets covered in red and he decides to call himself Red Dementis. You mean like a, a flare? <laughs> What's that? A red firework. Exactly what it is. It's a flare it's, gun. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not a fire, it's not a firework, though. Yeah, um, right. you called it a firework. You're the one who called it a firework. <laughs> I know, it's a, it's a, but it's the closest thing I can think of. Well, right, that's what Sean's telling you, what it literally is. It is and a flare, it's flare gun. Flare. No, it's not a firework. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. And then <laughs> how... <laughs> Matt, Matt could be a politician. He just said some incorrect shit and when corrected went, well, moving on. I should be a politician. 
You could be a leader in the wasteland, man. <laughs> you could be Dementis. Oh, you don't want... Oh, never mind. People better hope I don't move to Australia. Yo, yeah, this out. is actually a dusted documentary watch about Australia. Down under. <laughs> oh, watch out down under. Watch out down under. I also love how the Furiosa starts by zooming into Australia just to make sure nobody, nobody <laughs> misunderstands. This takes place in Australia. Nobody else, nowhere else in the world will this movie take place in except for Australia. Um, it's uh, back to back to the like, this thing. is just like how Australia is. This is exactly based right? of real life. I know, I know. Like the, just that, that man. It's incredible. Shout out to Australia. Shout anyway. out Australia. Also love how like Dark Trip Dementis. On the Barbie. Dark Dementis shows up and he just literally right, dresses in all all black. That's just how he is. He's just na- he just call- names himself after the colors he has. And what was it like? Uh, for D- Dementis, he already starts off. He start kind of starts off as like an antagonizing villain, right? Uh, how he's first introduced, he's introduced as like this like calm and calculating villain, and you see him be like this heartless leader, especially when you see uh, he he forces Furiosa to watch his mom literally get split apart, and you kind of get to see like the cracks of his facade, especially when he tries to tackle the um uh the 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 citadel. When it first comes to the Citadel, he first comes in and has all this bravado. He even has a microphone to announce himself like an MMA fighter and his <laughs> goons. I love his fucking him having the microphone the whole time is <laughs> it just adds so much. You know what? Dementis can be a politician. He'll be really good at that. It's upsetting but... how much it reflects like the political landscape though because dementis is so fucked up that you find yourself being like well we need to have immortan joe in power and immortan joe is like the biggest fucking rapist piece of shit but he's better than dementis because like (laughs) he gives you some water and like oh wow what does that make you think of (laughs) <laughs> also i want to i want to go back for two seconds that we we did not mention that praetorian jack just looks like snake he does look like oh yeah he looks like a uh, big boss in <laughs> Metal Gear solid three he looks, he looks like a human snakes don't have limbs <laughs> me and jason went for the same joke <laughs> of course i i know that like uh, no, my, mine was more eloquent <laughs> What is it? I know that like Snake is based off of uh, what's his face? Why am I forgetting his name from uh, from Escape the from thing? Kurt Russell's character. He's from... Yeah, Kurt Russell. Uh, Kurt and, like, Russell, baby. I know he's supposed to look like that, but Praetorian Jack just looks so. If you strapped a fucking you know what? bandana to his head, I would have been like, "Yep, that's There's... that's Snake." <laughs> that's what. <laughs> that's what I noticed about this movie and what i said while we were watching it like everyone looked like someone in this movie <laughs> i kept seeing people <laughs> and being like that looks like that person well, and this is sort of intentional but by it by the end of furiosa the last like couple shots of anya taylor joy you could convince me were charlie Theron if it wasn't which, for the fact that i know charlie Theron. well she sounds like charlie Theron to too. another mad max well, she sounds like charlie Theron too so it just blurs the line there and what's crazy yeah. is, like, Anya Taylor-Joy doesn't look like Charlize Theron in no, general. No, not at all. <laughs> but they do and, – and, but it also – some of it's the character work, though. I mean, yeah. granted, you hadn't seen Fury Road before, um, I guess, but there's still a part that just feels like it's just such a clear progression, and it's so seamless that even when you pick up Fury Road and it's a whole other person, you're just like, no, no, it's the same person. Um, yeah, it makes sense. It, it's really, it's really incredible. I, 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 across the board, the Mad Max movies are a testament to like, hey, maybe we should recast people instead of reanimating corpses and CGIing actors to look forty years younger. We could just get Tom Hardy or just get Anya Taylor Joy. Yeah, and that makes a lot more sense. But before I, before I forget, I kind of wanted to ask you guys if you 
apparently a lot of people read the Praetorian Jack Furiosa relationship as romantic. Um, I got to be honest, I didn't. When I saw it in theaters, I just saw like a mentor-mentee parental-esque relationship almost. And then I saw people talking about it as a romantic relationship um, online. So then when I watched it the second time, I was like looking, I was like, okay, let's kind of like view it through that lens. And I was just like, I don't, I think the two of them have tremendous chemistry. I just don't think it's romantically charged at all. And I'm just curious if that's like just me being a weirdo. Or... No, I didn't think of it romantic. I could see it as either way. Uh, I think the the scene where people see it as like a a romantic thing was when um Furiosa basically talks to Praetorian Jack and about about her home and how she would like to take him there. And then he like he, they I think he initially refuses by like putting the uh, the peach seed back into uh, Furiosa's hand, and then I think it was like the Ford head touch. That I think people saw that as like romantic interest. I could kind of see it that way, but then I just kind of saw it as her accepting him as like part of a family because that's what she did to you know all the people she was close with. Like all like you saw that the uh the many mothers how they um how they depart how they show love is through forehead touching, and so it kind of blurs the line a bit. I could see it as either or. Yeah, I, I don't mean to imply that I think it's like an invalid reading. It's just not the one I had to be to be clear. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't really give it that much thought, but I didn't think of it as romantic. Yeah, in the I... moment. I feel like if there were there was more of a push towards romantic and that it was more explicit, I would see that. But I the only thing I got was like love, but in a respecting way of like yeah. two people who appreciate each other and that's it, not romantic. Yeah. Exactly. They could love each other, but just not in a romantic way. But I can see how you could see it as in like a romantic light though because it doesn't shut the door on that uh possibility either but uh unfortunately before any conclusions can be made or any drones can be uh drawn in the sand praetorian check is killed by the it honestly was a really sad scene for me i hated it when he died because he was such a badass character and the fact that like Dementis <laughs> uh, tied him to a bike and then had him try to keep up with the bike and then eventually when he couldn't keep up was getting dragged on the floor he unleashed the dogs on him and they bit him and ate him while he was getting dragged across the floor and all the while Dementis was ranting about how it's not fair how they have love it's not fair and so they, they deserve death the method is such a fascinating character. Like I didn't finish my um, original thoughts on him, but uh, how he passes uh, gravitas air around him, and how he gives these gravid, like these grand speeches about him and his gang, and at first you start to you uh, you believe it, especially um, with him taking over uh, what was it Gastown, because. It was pretty smart. Oh, not not pretty smart, but he was able to conquer Gastown, and oh, wait, no, sorry. Yeah, he was able to conquer Gastown, but you saw like his methods, like how he conquered Gastown was he tried to uh, have like fake men dressed as war boys drive the truck into Gastown and pretend to shoot them so that they would open the gate. They initially don't believe it. And so he just had his men shoot the fake actors. And then they bought into it. And even his own captain, one of his own captains calls him scum. And that just kind of sticks with him for the rest of the movie. Because he's shown himself to be scum. Especially when he turns into Dark Dementis. I have to keep saying that, that every Octoboss? single time. Huh? Was it's Octoboss, Octoboss who it's calls Octoboss. him scum? Because yeah, we got to talk about Octoboss a little bit. Because he... Awesome costume, awesome name. The naming convention in all the Mad Max movies is incredible, if you can't tell. But then 
and then just real quick the bombing knocker scene with octoboss oh. that's my favorite set piece um at least in furio so i feel like the set pieces in Fury Road are probably a touch better in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then especially at the end, where he was basically at his wit's end and how he basically ran Gas Town to the ground. I like how we saw like a glimpse of all the different towns. We saw bo uh, the Bullet Farm, we saw the Citadel, and even though you know, there was obviously a hierarchy, it wasn't in absolute disarray. But then when you go into Gas Town once Dementis took over, it's an absolute shithole. People are constantly rioting, and they hate the Mantis's ass so, so much. And yet he continues to ride around in his glorious monster truck and just spouting about how he wants what they want and how he, they're going to do uh, get more food and making all these false promises like a false prophet. It's great. It's great. And then I love like the conclusion of the movie between, and it's just a, we need to talk about the conclusion of the movie because to show the real difference between Furiosa and Mad Max, Furiosa builds up to this war between the Mentis and the Citadel. And it is condensed down to a 30 second montage. What could have been possibly one of the biggest action scenes in maybe movie history. They condensed it down to a montage, and we don't we get to see the aftermath. We don't even get to see like maybe five seconds of a fight. And instead of the war being the conclusion, the ending is Furiosa chasing down Dementis and the rest of his gang. And was honestly a very entertaining um chase scene. Especially with like a I feel like with how like how she's like how she's uh framed in a lot of the shots is almost like a almost like a predator chasing after her prey is inevitable before she gets her hands on them but i want to i want to see what your guys opinion of the uh, conclusion is right <laughs> like, i mean it's perfect like both times i watched it and the second time we watched it we were rolling right into fury road but like when we sat in the theater and the movie ended i was like play fury road right now um it's just like uh, <clears throat> I didn't realize it was going to so seamlessly roll together. And I think it's absolutely excellent that it does. And I think emotionally, like, like it's 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 both heartbreaking when, like, Praetorian Jack dies and Furiosa loses her arm and the world is shit. But at the same time, there's this, like, energy that hits you of her, of the movie ending with, like, setting up her, you know, fighting back and taking taking the lives from a Morton Joe um that is makes you feel like uh, pardon me for being dramatic but it makes you feel revolutionary because that's what she's about to start mm -hmm. and you fully buy into this world and the characters of it yeah yeah which seeing the ending and going directly into Mad Max like we did when we were watching it together makes it feel like one seamless really long movie and i loved that uh but yeah the the ending was fantastic for furiosa and it to me rounds out and sets up perfectly the considering i hadn't seen mad max before this it sets up mad max you fury road you motherfucker i okay it's not my fault i I knew that Mad Max existed. It was just never something that I was like, ooh, I want to go see that, because the only things I had known from George Miller prior to that were Happy Feet, and I forget <laughs> what else. <laughs> and the fact, that, the fact 5, that... 5,000 Years of Longing, excellent George Miller uh, movie. I have not seen that Did you see either. that? Oh, I, thought, I thought you saw that. My bad. Anyway, sorry. I did, I did want to see that, uh, and that was something I just missed when it was in theaters. What else did I know George Miller for? This man's got a weird fucking filmography. Oh, yeah. I seen, <laughs> he made Babe. He, sorry, he produced and co-wrote co Babe and then directed the sequel to Babe. <laughs> What's Babe? It's about <laughs> exactly. the talking pig. pig. It's about is talking it a, pig. Is it is like, um, like Babe? Do you guys think we're talking animals? Oh, fuck. 
Oh, God. So, like, yeah, I, I knew him from Babe and Happy Feet, and then he also Babe. made Mad Max. <laughs> I miss if you want to know what George Babe Miller's is about. most beloved movie is Babe and Happy Feet. I miss Babe, Babe is about a, a pig who wants to become, like, a sheepdog or something like that. I don't remember anything about Babe except for that. And the last time I watched Babe, I still had a functioning VHS. Oh, it's old. It's an old movie. It's the only like story the involving VHS from my childhood? Hmm? Yeah. So you want to hear a story about VHS from my childhood? I'll make sure. it quick. Um, so weird thing, just fun fact about me. Um, so my dad had all the original Star Wars movies on VHS, like the original non-special edition versions. I watched them like fucking crazy as a child. For some reason, I thought my dad would be mad if I would. So that's one thing. But it's also funny for me looking back because they all have, like, interviews with George Lucas beforehand, and I always was like, I can't fast forward through these fast enough. Why do I want to hear these people talk? I want Star Wars. And now I'm like, love that type of shit. So, I don't know. You just saying that made me think of it, and I wanted to... That's say because words. you're a child. Great story. Lightsabers clashing against each other, like... It, pumps so much dopamine into your brain and then watching an old man talk is just the most boring shit ever as a child but then it's funny enough like that's what you want want me to watch it um i don't know maybe how old were you when you watched it maybe you thought it was like a thing for adults only and so you can't watch it star wars man i don't know why are you asking me to justify your childhood thoughts i'm not I'm not you're, a child you, anymore. I'm not this, you as a wait, child. Is, is, wait, man, wait, is this not therapy? No, huh? wait. We need to. Is this not therapy? This is basically therapy. This I thought. Therapy. I thought you were my life. I thought this was. I. I. I gotta go, man. Sorry, you owe me seven dollars. I'm sorry for the detour. <laughs> you fucking wish. <laughs> my goodness. Just a sixty-nine. Nice. This this nice. episode is purely just to. Oh. Rub off the rust. All right, so well, you know what? I'm just gonna. Yeah, bud. Huh? What, what are you gonna do, Matt? Nothing. You Matt's rubbing, oh, like, rubbing off Matt over there. You don't have your camera on. <laughs> he's rubbing off the rust. Uh, you Matt doesn't have his camera on. I can't confirm that he's not jerking that shit. I don't have a camera. By that shit. Computer. Oh my god. Like Matt's I, Jake saying Matt doesn't have his camera on. I'm pretty. I can't say he's not jerking it. And then Matt says, "Well, I don't have my camera on." I know Schrodinger's masturbation. Um, I I, hey, I, I, I I've heard Matt talk. I've heard Matt talk about these movies. He is passionate. I am, but when he tries to condense it down to like a a podcast episode, especially after the first one in three months, is a little. Well, Matt, first of all, it was still just a joke about you jerking off. But second, why don't you rant some more then? Here, come on. I'm not in the ranting mood right now. Lay it on us. Why don't you rant? I can't rant. I can't rant when the movie is so good. Matt, fuck you. Well, I ran in a good way. Spiel about how much you love Fury Road. Well, that's what I was going to get to. Fury Road is also an incredible movie by uh, George Miller. And it was like one of like the first movies where it kind of like blew my mind about how good action could be because I was kind of uh, in like the childhood mindset of how giant CGI monsters were still like the best thing ever. And then I just grew to like Transformers slop. You must have really loved the Transformers movies. Oh, I used to love Revenge of the Fallen. Oh my God. Yeah, it was that, <laughs> I was that kid. It was horrible but i loved it because it was giant giant robots fighting against each other little did i know that movie had little to no substance maybe we should make that a podcast episode that's for another day that can be and um Big Mac. the movie is just mesmerizing it's literally just how george miller described it it's like watching poetry emotion it's it's absolutely seamless it's absolutely beautiful and it's honestly a very simple movie. It's not that complicated. The story is very straightforward. Uh, 
Furiosa steals uh, Immortal Joe's wives, and he now takes this entire war party to go after her to get them back. That's basically what the story comes down to. And that's honestly a huge strength for the movie because they don't really need to explain or have any kind of exposition dump. They mostly just focus on like the characters. And even the characters themselves don't have that much dialogue. Like Max doesn't have that much dialogue. And yet I feel like he has so much personality because he doesn't come off as like human. He comes up more or less like an animal in the beginning of the movie. He kind of grunts more than he talks. That's how I feel about you, Matt. (laughs) I grunt? Sometimes that's kind of true. I guess it's kind of true. He kind of grunts more than he talks. And he spends like a majority of the movie just pointing a gun at somebody. <laughs> That's really it. But it's 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 great. And then the, every single fight scene is absolutely incredible. From like the first one where um uh they were fighting off like some of like the bandits. Uh, and then that's when we forget our first witness me, uh, witness me scene. Oh. And then, um, oh, yeah, witness me. That was like <laughs> a meme for a little bit. I loved it. And then my favorite fight scene was when they, um, they were in the in the chasm, running away from the biker gang. That was absolutely incredible, especially the music. It's uh, the music, the person who composed the music for uh. Mad Max was Junkie XL. I have mixed feelings about him because uh, he has made some questionable decisions composing, especially when it comes to the MonsterVerse, but I gotta give him credit. The soundtrack for Mad Max is absolutely incredible. And I recommend everybody listen to it. It's a good listen. And nothing pumps up, nothing pumps your blood more than listening to a Mad Max soundtrack. Although one thing, one word of caution, don't listen to it while you're driving. Listen to because it while you're if you listen to if you listen to it while you're driving, you might want you might be tempted to floor it and drive down the road as fast as you can because that's that's what this movie puts that's what this movie puts you into. It's like the mood it puts you into. See, but that would be fantastic if I drew if I drove if I had like a license to drive an actual rig, uh, and I started playing Mad Max music, I would go off the road and I would hit everything possible with my rig. The war rigs in the movie, by the way, I love. <laughs> oh, and you know what else? You know the other thing that I always like lumped uh, Mad Max in with in my head was like Doom, the video game. I don't know anything about that game either. <laughs> but like, Why? I, 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 was, I can see I, that. I I haven't played Doom, but our friend our friend Alo, shout out Alo. You'll get another shout out later since you made the podcast art. Um loves doom and like the the color palette is similar i think the tone is kind of similar i yeah i, I, I don't know I, I don't, that's, that's a all lot. i know about doom i don't, I don't know if i'd like, say the tone about, like, killing is people. i mean i don't i i think they both have a lot of like morbid fucked up shit violence right but also doom, like but, doom is a little bit about a one-man people. army who goes into the depths of hell only because That's he hates Deacon that, that, that much. Army, yes. And it's so funny because Doom is like very tongue in cheek, very. Oh, yeah. It's, it's like borderline you don't, you satire. Don't think Dementis is tongue in cheek, though? Like, do, oh, Dementis no, like, is. Because... The fact that Dementis' color palette changes with his like diminishing mental state is so on the nose but like because dementis is so over the top it works like i feel like that's kind of like i'm not saying it's one-to-one but i think like the doom versus mad max thing makes a lot more sense than like doom versus um compared to hunger games which is like pretty much like the dystopian supernatural um superficial level is like the only real connection there well, again, like, I don't know anything the, the, the about between, games or Doom. The thing about Doom is that it's borderline a parody because the yeah. Doom guy is so overpowered and he's he has a one-track mind like no other. 
the solution to every single problem in that in that in that game in both games actually is to shoot it or to stab it or to tear it up into multiple pieces with your bare hands and there's nobody that can stop him there is multiple characters in that in that game who say you can't do it you can't beat me or you can't kill me and guess what he does all of the above every single time i just think aesthetic i think there's a lot aesthetically that lines up like the difference is that like mad max like it takes itself more seriously and it does have more somber moments you don't get somber moments in doom uh like um i don't know if somber I moments like what, when max finally about. tells furiosa his name at the end of fury road great that was, that great was, moment that was That's great. like was that so or nux but... you you did my boy nux dirty you didn't even include him in your brief pro like Nux is my favorite arc that. between Nux the two movies, so and there's so many, so much good competition. But Nux being a war boy who's just so desperate for Morton Joe's approval, and like the all, the war boys are like their whole purpose is to like kill themselves so that Morton Joe gets what he wants, and it, ending with him sacrificing himself so like the woman he lo- like so that uh, capable, and the other wives he get to the citadel and topple Morton Joe's empire. Um, I, I mean that's just it's it's beautiful work from Nicholas Hall. Yeah, you know what? Then, well, yeah, let's segue a little bit and give a shout out to Knox because he does have a beautiful arc. Oh my God, when he when he dies and he says "Witness me," but in like a whisper. He, exactly. Because okay, the, the yeah the top, oh, oh oh yeah we we, 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 we need more tumors. context. I love his tumors, tumors that he talks to. All his his tumors that he named. <laughs> yeah, well, I feel like his we need friends, like a little more context. His, 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 oh. Because like um yeah like in Mad Max they introduced the the Citadel, and it's like run by Morton Joe, and his minions are war boys. They're uh his I think I believe his like his malformed sons who are like totally totally demented both made psychologically and physically like we just mentioned before like nux has two tumors in which he gives faces and has names and like nux comes off not going not he doesn't come off but he's basically the same as all the other war boys all the war boys idolize immortal joe like a god and i love their prayer i love how like you know, they put their hands together and they like cross their fingers together to form like a V8 engine and they chant V8. Oh, that's so cool. That's so corny, but it's so cool. And um, like he he's just totally brainwashed at first. He totally believes in Morton Joe and he will do everything in his power to make sure Morton Joe even notices him. Like I remember like one of my one of my favorite uh, scenes was when uh, Nux was invited to ride with Morton Joe, and then his was it was like his uh, his partner talked about how he has Nux's boot and so he should also ride with Morton Joe, and he was so desperate to get on that, and he was so pissed when he couldn't get on that. Uh, I did love all of his antics to try and get noticed. I know <laughs> it gives me strong notice me senpai vibes. Oh, it's so strong, so strong. <laughs> And then it, when it, he, it's both funny. I was just no, going to say ahead. real quick. I was just going to say when he finally gets the moment to impress the Morton Joe, and then he totally fucks up <laughs> by uh by dropping the gun. Oh, yeah. and, he, and Morton Joe calls him mediocre. He's crestfallen. He looks like a like an abandoned puppy. It's so sad. Yeah, it is great. Nux is so good. All the war boys are funny. They're good. He, he's he serves like he's kind of the comic relief character in like how pathetic he is. Like Matt said, like he like is so desperate for this like to be witnessed. Um, and it just never works out for him. But it like it works in such a way of like it's both entertaining to and like sad and funny to watch his like desperation for that. But it also really shows that like everyone's your main characters of this like these two movies are. Their arcs are all very redemptive. Praetorian Praetorian Jack is working 
for a Morton Joe for his own survival, but ends up, you know, wanting to help someone else, help Furiosa. Furiosa similarly is kind of doing working for bad people out of survival necessity, but ends up putting herself at risk to to free the wives. And then Max, Matt already talked about Max starting out like super animalistic and like he barely even talks, but by the end he's kind of his humanity is very restored through what he witnesses Furiosa do. And then, but the nux at the, like, no rhyme intended crux of that, of, like, someone who is so far gone that is so, has drunk so much of the figurative Kool-Aid for Morton <laughs> Joe that even he, <laughs> through Capable's kindness, can see that something's wrong and ultimately, like, sacrifice himself to help other people that... People are. I, I'm such a sucker for any like re- coming of age and redemption arcs are the two like broad level things that I'm just almost always going to be a sucker for. And, and, and Nux is like the ultimate like people can grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One With thing I was season. I was really excited about going into this movie was I wanted to see what kind of noises and voice uh, Tom Hardy had going on. And then there's, you, get, you get so little. And I get so little, but it was good. He he the did have... The grunts and the noises he makes, man, they're they're magnificent. He's such a good, like... He's so good at just, like, voices and making noises that are entertaining to listen to. He barely speaks and barely makes noise in this movie, but he still does it. And he's also just entertaining to watch. He's He was such a good fit for this movie. For like just a brooding, borderline nonverbal, uh, hulking protagonist, he was so good. Yeah, I agree with that. And back to what Jake talked about, like a redemption arc. I feel like this redemption arc was more sweet because we talked about how the warboards are basically brainwashed and how they'll do anything for this literal dictator. And horrible person but then like when nux is able to have a conversation with capable you kind of realize that he's just a kid he's extremely naive and the only thing he knows is the morton joe he doesn't really know anything else and then like the the kindness of capable like totally changes his allegiance i mean it has a beautiful the whole movie has a beautiful Oh, ending to it. I mean, if we're talking about like the conclusion of arcs, because I, I, I mean, it, it, like it's it's not super clean cut in that like one of the wives is killed along the way, <laughs> and it's not like you have this resolution of like the, this desolate wasteland being saved. But it, it does feel good to see Furiosa be able to take the Citadel, um, and essentially free a lot of people from this real you know to an extent from this reality they're in and to see her have kind of brought max back out from that animalistic side as he slips off into and obviously nux dying sad too uh god damn uh slipping off into like and that's tying that into that moment of her watching max who she thought kind of was on the platform just slip away into the crowd gets so recontextualized by Furiosa and her relationship with Praetorian Jack and being able to, I think, see him, see Praetorian Jack in Max now in that moment in a way that, like, Jack brought such, brought the best out of her and she couldn't save him but was able to do something similar and feel herself personally redeemed in in bringing in who max be is again at the end of fury road if that makes any sense that does make sense oh but i want to kind of segue into another thing i want to talk about because we kind of i can't constantly talked about it when i was talking about fury uh furiosa but it's just how good it is the action in uh mad max it's so good and this the sound design, I don't think, honestly think, is what makes the difference between like Mad Max and some other movies. 
explosions have such like a like a robust feel to them. That's the thing though, it's like you can feel the sounds. And nothing like emphasizes it more when um the scene where they were in the cavern running away from the biker gang and the engine was on fire. Fioriosa puts down like the what was it? The plower, the the like the snow plower, so the sand gets up into the engine to pull it out. And then once the sand goes away, you see like the engine like breathe in air. And it actually is like a like a sound effect of it breathing in. If that was not needed, that was like a shot that totally could have skipped it and it still would have been an amazing scene. But that that's just that added touch just makes the difference of just making the truck seem like it, its own entity, its own thing. It's just fantastic. Oh, and um oh my gosh, like what 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 other scenes do I like? All uh, of them. You're welcome. Well, I do like all of them. But I, I want to like shout out like the more creative uh, ways they implement action. Oh, like the um, the guys in the poles oh, at, the, uh, yes. at the last fight scene. I love um, it seeing them like fucking in the middle of everything. They're just flying around towards each other on each side to get onto the war rig. <laughs> yeah, and my favorite scene is when uh Mad Mad Max gets caught by one, and it tries to throw him off. But he's able to get the slip and throw the guy off instead, and you can see him like, of, uh, like being wagged across the screen while explosions were happening in the background. Ten out of ten shots. Which the way that they managed to even like do all that at one time <laughs> to me is incredible to think of alone. Like the amount of like detail and work that probably had to go into just getting everything set up perfectly so that they could get those shots in action to me is like i I don't know how they could even think of doing that it's so impressive such all the action sequences and all the 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 camera work during it is so impressive it's like I, I think I said this while we were watching it, but it's, like, just such a movie, you know? It uses the technique of, I mean, I don't know, I say technique, to, like, I know what the fuck I'm talking about, but, like, it uses... Technique. But it uses... Technique. Film. Technique. And, like, <laughs> it uses, like, the cinematic format to such a, like large scale in in a yeah. way that's like not that I don't see much in movies. So would you say that Mad Max pushes uh the movie the medium of movies to its absolute limits? Yeah, like it, it they really just like it looks like there was so much thought in put into it to like make it as like big and as well rounded and like you know, as possible, you know, and they, I think they succeeded in many ways. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, this is, I feel like this movie has become like a, such a cult status. It kind of reaches like MF Doom territory. (laughs) This is like your favorite filmmaker's favorite movie. (laughs) MF Doom. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean. You know what I mean. I know exactly. they're, both, they're both like legendary. Like I mean, that's I, a no, fair I, comparison. It's it's a fair comparison, but it, it just was funny. That's <laughs> just such an interesting <laughs> comparison. I, mean, you know, I was thinking as shit was blowing up. You know, I was thinking about that that guitar sample and rap snitch Ganishes. <laughs> you know that. You know who could have played that guitar? <laughs> The Doof Warrior. Oh my god. Wait, that Dude. was the Doof Warrior? No, I'm just saying no. No, no, no. I'm just... No, no, I'm no, just no, no, no. Not, not in the song, but like the Doof Warrior is the guy who was playing the guitar during the yeah. entire... Yeah. I didn't know his name. I, I didn't know he was the called Doof the Doof Warrior. Warrior. No, yeah, that's what I referenced player. up top. Yeah, the Doof Warrior is the guitar guy in the red one-piece pajamas oh, and the like... Is that, yeah, yeah, shit. that made it ten like, times better. No. I... I the knew you called that, out the do for you, but the fact like, that he's called all, the do for you. Did they have a guy who's really playing his warrior? And all he's, he does his only is purpose like, is to play battle music. 
He doesn't. He is fight, just one of the war rigs. A warrior yeah. in the traditional sense. Oh yeah, no, but he, he, but his guitar suits fire, and he's just they. They're like, we know we need to spend our very limited resources on making an entire truck that is just amps, so we can have this guy suspended <laughs> yeah, from has, wires playing flaming yeah. guitar while we go to battle. Yeah, it's crazy, and, and I right, kept that's saying a, that amazing use of resources. I kept saying that during the movie that like I just was so happy that they just brought their friend to shred every single time they went into battle. Hey, you gotta have the bard with you when you're going it's into like, battle. Well he was like their version of the drummer dumb. boy, you know, right? Like you you in olden days you'd have the drummer boy marching you in. He was yeah. their drummer boy. Yeah, except, except for he's except like ten he times more badass. Except he was just dope as shit. Yeah, exactly, because he has a metal guitar and it's a flamethrower too. Yeah, instead of being a dumb little drummer, he he was just actually sick. But you know what? He has a dedication Drum for our drummer boy. He has a dedication of a drummer boy. Like how drummer boys march down the field while bullets graze across their face. <laughs> uh, yeah, Cool about Dude, the Doof Warrior boy. gets punched in the face by Mad Max, and yet he continues to rock on. Yeah, and what I'm saying is that, like, there's nothing cool about being a drummer boy and getting bullets. Like, it's brave, don't get me wrong, and having bullets whiz past you. But, like, there's everything cool about being the, do- the Doof Warrior. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I want to be called the Doof Warrior from now on. Mm-hmm. Okay. Honestly, I'm fine with that. I- I'll call you that. When I hear Doof Warrior, I'm thinking of Doofenshmirtz, but in like a fucking like gladiator Evil outfit. What? Evil Incorporated? Yes. Oh. I also oh, want to man. talk about the... Shout, the, Phineas and Ferb. Shout, Phineas and Ferb. It's getting another season, so I'm excited for that. Goated. Uh, so I, I also want to talk about the color of the film. I love how orange oh, it is. Thank God. That yellow. That yellow orange and red. Tint and red. Like the all way it the, offsets so, the greenery. Mm-hmm. It's so good, and I love how the night shots are just so blue. It's just blue. It's not dark. It's not gray. It's just blue. And you, you feel the relief of how how much cooler it must be at night, which is so not the case in real life because that was still daytime. But it, yeah, like it feels so much cooler, right? It doesn't feel like you're getting blasted by the sun. It's just interesting to me that in real life the nighttime you... scenes are were also shot in daytime, so they were miserable. <laughs> Because the co- and the color grade is so like the way it's saturated that it looks everything looks irradiated, which it would be because it's like the, it's a nuclear wasteland. wasteland. So then the the sparse green when you see it pops and you're like, oh yeah, this is why people would do all of these awful things for that. Wait, it's a nuclear wasteland and not a teenage wasteland. No, this is Australia, not Vietnam. Oh dang! Good God. But um, yeah, the the color of the uh, the color of the movie is also fantastic. And honestly, I want to I want to talk about like scenes that stuck out to you because for me, my one of my favorite scenes was when the truck got got stuck, and they were trying to get it out, and Mad Max basically takes a gigantic like he takes a gigantic sword, and just tells her to keep going forward. Even when he does, if even if he doesn't come back, and then you just hear this explosion in the background, and you see a figure coming, uh, coming to them, and Furiosa brings out a gun, aims towards the figure in case it wasn't Mad Max, but be whoa, and just one like, uh, a one swipe of sand, like he shows up, covered in blood. And he starts to wash it off, and one of the wives asks if he's okay. And he just he just goes, huh, huh, <laughs> like an animal. And uh, Furiosa just says, "It's not his blood. It's so badass." 
I did not do that scene just justice, but it, I feel like it's impossible to do that scene justice just from explaining it. Like you just you just have to see it. You're right. Yeah, between the two movies, that's got to be in my like top three scenes too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I I think that the bombing knocker scene, which is also where Praetorian Jack realizes that Furiosa, like who like meets Furiosa, and that she's not a like rig war boy or whatever that she. she um, that she's a woman. Um, incredible scene. And then I already mentioned it, but J- Max telling Furiosa that his name is Max. Mm-hmm. Off the top of my head, those are like the standout. Like, I just like think about those on a random day because they're so good scenes. I'm also surprised about the fight scenes. They're very well paced for being so chaotic in nature. It does. T- I will say nothing feels rushed, especially in like the final fight scene where there's so many, so many cars and trucks, and yet it gives you enough time to get like a a picture of everything that's happening without overwhelming you. Like I, I feel like that's just something you can't that most people can't do. Like George Miller is just that guy. God, I hope he doesn't die. I wish he will live forever. To I live wish. forever, Matt. Live forever. Uh, That's another had, Oasis reference. If I were to find uh, a fountain of youth, the first person I'll give it to is George Miller. <laughs> that man will never die. Ah, oh, goodness. Well, yeah, Sean, what's your favorite scene? I'd I'd either give it to the bombing knocker, or I'm trying. I'd, I'd mostly give it to the bombing knock, if anything, just because I love that scene. <laughs> um, or any scene with Dementus in it. <laughs> God damn it. Dement- I don't care if it's action or not. Dementus rules for me. Fair enough. Menace 2024. Menace 2024. <laughs> Red Dementis, 2024, Dark Dement. The, the, the different Dementuses can be the running mates. It's Dementis against Dark Dementis. Yeah. Do you think if he was able to escape, what kind of Dementis would he be? What's past Dark Dementis? Honestly, I feel like you're crashing into him killing himself. Because he's so <laughs> distraught. And, uh, the, 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 the movies are so good about like making it clear that all of these people that are so weird and fucked up were just normal. Like, like it's never like stated, but Dementus always has this little teddy bear with him. So it's it, it's very clear. And the way he talks about, he calls her little D, uh, young Furiosa. Like, it's very clear that like this guy was like a loving father that probably worked like an office job. And then the apocalypse happened. And, I, like, every character in the movie is... You know what? Also, real quick, got to say this because it just came to my mind. The way Morton, Jai's di- Morton Joe dies is sick. Anyway, <laughs> um, like, everybody was just, like, a person. And then this happened. And there's a lot of people that just, like, push came to shove. And some, some bad shit came out for some of these people from just about everyone to some degree. Um, so, but I, I think, like, to answer your question, like, given his declining ability to enjoy life, even through the most perverse means, I feel like he probably just kills himself. That's really, like, one of the best parts of, like, the movies is just seeing his, like, descent into madness and depression. Is Like, Dementis, he starts off as such a charismatic, confident villain like by the time he dies he's just kind of pathetic <laughs> i i would have loved to see daddy dementis he he had a daughter at one point i want to see daddy dementis daddy if you get dementis. to be the doof warrior i get to be daddy dementis <laughs> well it's probably going to be what jake talked about about how he's just a regular office worker who is probably just like a loving father and then when the apocalypse happened and then she was taken away from him he would like, he like lost it, and this went on this like s- on this huge spiral, which is basically just him trying to find a way to kill himself, because like it's just like the final confrontation between him and Furiosa was basically that was basically it. Like that's basically what he admitted to Furiosa was that he was he done all these horrible th- things just to feel alive again, 
I also I also want to know where they got all the BDSM outfits for everyone. Like, did everyone? A lot of probably already had it, and they just you <laughs> used it in the bedroom. And they use it as your everyday wear for the apocalypse. <laughs> Dang, it's the apocalypse. Guess it's time I get out my. No, the sex <laughs> shop gets raided first in the apocalypse. <laughs> the sex... you, you, honestly, it's probably food then sex shop. But do you guys think there's, like, a 30-year cycle? Like, the way you talk about, like, culture and fashion having a 30-year cycle and, like, normally, do you think that still occurs in the apocalypse? That, so, like, the exact type of fetish wear that they're using changes every, you know, so often, and eventually <laughs> stuff comes back in style? Absolutely. What do you think that's dead with, you know, the whole... Does that, like, go away, too, with the whole, like, trying to survive? No, because fashion all? is art and culture, and you can't kill art and culture. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Sean, you've never watched Mad Max 2, right? I haven't watched any of the older Mad Max movies, no. More humongous. Uh, that's exactly who I was going to mention. You will love the humongous. He is as ridiculous as he sounds. But, um, yeah, like, a lo- just Mad Max and Furiosa, they, they do an excellent job of selling the world as being, like, desolate wastelands and yet still are so full of personality. And that personality being literally crazy. That's, like, that's Psychotically crazy. That's one of the things I also have to give them huge props for. This is... Usually when I see deserts in movies, I could clock out so fast just because I, I hate... <laughs> I say this is somebody who's never you lived in a sand? desert. I Do hate sand? Do you hate sand. sand? I hate sand. It's coarse it's and coarse, rough. Rough. Gets everywhere. Gets everywhere. But, but gee, I just there are so many things I have seen that do not make deserts look like a fun place to be, but because of that, they make them so goddamn boring. I I can't think of anything off the top of my head and that pisses me off, but like I if I had more examples I would, but there are like very few pieces of media where I like this thing because it's set in the desert uh and or even just like i like this and it being set in a desert elevates it and like this being set in a wasteland that's just a fucking desert i love it to death i think it like works so perfectly it's, in this it's case the perfect format it wouldn't work in like new york city and like it's so much more it's so much better for it and like they make it so c- colorful despite the fact that the only colors you could realistically have for, like, the land is fucking yellow and red. Like, uh, tan. Uh, and, like, they still managed to take that, like, up and keep it from visually looking like the drabbest thing and the most boring thing I've ever seen, which, like, huge props to the cinematography there because like it really and the color grading and editing and everything because it really could have been if oh, under yeah. under somebody with less talent it could have really been ass i mean the <laughs> desert is fucking boring that's where they built the sphinx and shit they, <laughs> they needed some to look at they need to add some gravitas to the desert <laughs> They need, that's why they built the Sphinx and shit may go down as one of my favorite quotes from this podcast. <laughs> like, I'm not laughing hard enough to to show it, I guess, but I that got me. <laughs> Am I wrong? No, that's why it's funny. <laughs> they, they needed something. Yeah, like, yeah. Those, oh, we for me, like, sand, desert, desert scenes and movies are kind of like the, uh, here. like the water levels of video games. They're just something you just kind of get through to get to the more entertaining section of the movie and it's like underwater mario levels like oh, exactly God. or like it's or like the, the water parts temple. of this podcast <laughs> uh but i think that's a good analogy matt it's just it it has the potential to be so just just a slog and it's not and i think that like you have just like you have games and stuff that use water that are like surprisingly really really good like you have your subnauticas and shit where it's all in water exactly. but then you have the mario water levels <laughs> where you're like i want to die i wish i was dead 
God, this sucks. I want to play Mario. <laughs> you, know what? you know what? Maybe it's just because it's the Amazon desert, right? No, not the Amazon. The, the Australian desert. I don't know why I say Amazon. Yeah, but, uh, but you're tired. I am tired. It's 1030. But, um, We're all tired. It's, maybe tired it's just because... Yeah, it's just because it's an Australian desert. And everything in Australia is weird and funky and dangerous like next time you want to film your movie you want to film like a desert scene in your movie go to australia don't go to the sahara like that's that shit's overrated all right that shit's overrated (laughs) it it is uh all right well you want to wrap it up no you're the boss tonight baby no no we continue we're continuing you're the boss you're the boss baby uh jake i just got a great idea for a movie Hey, you don't no, don't steal my next pick. God, I hope. Uh, <laughs> well, for wrapping up, I of course recommend both. Yeah, I oh. I think it's kind of obvious that we all recommend both movies. We 100%. all love these two movies. I was a little mixed on them. <laughs> Shut the fuck yeah, up. I mean, you. these are all these are like all time level good movies. I mean, them. Fury Road won like seventy two Oscars. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, another missed opportunity for a sixty-nine. Oh, nice. That's hard. I've been honestly, guys. I've been trying to think about like what I would even say for least favorite part this whole time. There's, because I like, can't. what do you say? I I, 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 I would what maybe like a touch more of the wives, but like at the cost of what you know. So I I, I wish I Tom guess Hardy maybe that, talked more. Maybe? <laughs> yeah, like one more grunt from Tom Hardy wouldn't have hurt. I I would have loved another grunt. Yeah, sometimes when you're like picking a least favorite part of a movie that's like just made by such a master at this specific mm-hmm. thing, it's like okay, my dumbass. What's my dumbass gonna well, say about it? Like, like other other than like the jackass who picked Bloodshot. We're talking about good movies for one shots, so it's like, what do you? We we just kind of keep being like nitpicky if we're gonna find anything. Right. It's like, oh, I'm gonna say, oh, well, maybe I would have liked to see Tom Hardy talk a little bit more because I like Tom Hardy and I li- would have liked to see the character more. But then I'm like, okay, well, fucking no, because it I mean, was... it's really a Furiosa movie. Yeah, and also it's also like. Uh, no, he was he he was perfect in it as was. Well, I'm not gonna fucking. It, it 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 also honestly gets hard to talk about favorites because it's like, what do I pick? Do I pick the color grading? Do I say the performances? If if I want to narrow it down to like a specific character arc, like I talked about how much I loved Nux, but also Furiosa's story across two movies is beautiful. Max's story is beautiful. It's like I, I mean, don't. I think my favorite part is just. Uh, Anya and Charlize as a collective, their performance. Can as I, a can I, like, character it, performance, like they. Is just... it lame if I say like, the, the willingness to experiment, like even like talking about your like the collective performance, like being willing to say like let's cast a different actor, let's, let's make a prequel that like completely recontextualizes the original masterpiece. Let's do these. Like, apparently these movies, like, they thought Fury Road was going to, like, the cast of Fury Road was like, this is going to be awful, because it was an awful, like, horrible shoot. And then the thing won so many Oscars. Like, the the, the willingness to just, like, go beyond what's expected and try new things. Um, like, but is that even an answer? I mean, I like the balance between, here, I'll, I like the balance between, like, the raw entertainment value of the movie simultaneous with like how emotionally it hits and how relevant it is to like each passing day it feels more like it should happen fair enough fair enough all right i don't know well then thank you to elephant for the podcast artwork well no one else no one else gives oh shit i'm sorry Nope, 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 nope. You've already started, Matt. You gotta end it. It's too late. Sorry. Goodbye. Oh, goodbye. (laughs) Sean, you gotta be careful. He's gonna hang up. (laughs) You know exactly he would do that. 
Yeah, that's why I told you to be careful. <laughs> that's why I wanted to have. I wanted to have it. I want to. I want to see I it just, happen. I just. I just. I just didn't want to be the last one to talk. That's why I jumped in first because I. I, I don't want to be the last one to talk about it. Well, all I can say is same. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing more to say. Same. It's yeah. It's incredible. Charlie's Theron and and what's her name were tremendous. That suck. And and uh, good, Anya Taylor Joy. That's movie. her name. Matt movie good. Matt Miller Mario good. Great. Matt Pickle movie. <laughs> Pickle movie. The movies. Next time I will try not to be I'll try to open up some space so then we don't have to talk about a movie we watched like maybe like a like a month ago. <laughs> you take that back. This was an excellent pick. No no no. I'm not I'm not that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say like I shouldn't I need to keep a spot open so we don't record a podcast like a month after we watch the movie. Oh, you mean for recording. I thought you meant for like how recently the movie came out because I was like, no, 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 no. cares. No, I'm not (laughs) talking about the movie itself. I'm talking about how we need to record a little earlier, closer to the when we watch the movie, so then I won't be struggling saying, uh and trying to remember certain scenes of what I liked about the movie because uh, I already have a really bad memory. And even though it's a movie oh, that no. like, I need to take my time. Well, uh, do you want to do you wanna plug our shit then before you forget that too? Holy. Uh, wait, don't we, wait, don't we, wait, why is the owl fed thing first then? <laughs> That's is always the, first. Is the, Oh, okay. yeah. So let, me just, let me just mention it. Thank you to Alofest yeah, for the podcast yeah. artwork. And thank you, Jason, for the podcast music. Give them your socials. Yeah, podcast music. I made it. Uh, mm. uh, I'm working on music. It's I, my taking a side side step from that because i'm mostly focusing on other things and i'm busy and also because i'm in a band now with our friend casey shout out casey so if you want to follow uh me specifically to uh to it, when i eventually make more music myself and put it out you can go to the Upsides PA on Instagram, the underscore Upsides PA on Twitter, the Upsides on SoundCloud. Um, and I'm drumming for our me and our friend Casey's band, Faraday. You can see that at Faraday P- Band PA on Instagram, F-A-R-A-D-A-Y, Faraday. There you go. There we go, baby. All right. So please follow Culture Illiterate on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and subscribe to Culture Illiterate Podcast on YouTube. You can follow us on illiterate underscore pod on both Twitter and Instagram. And fuck you. Fuck you, Jake. Uh, reach, you can reach out to us at cultureilliteratepod at gmail.com for questions and comments. And we continue with one more one shot episode for now, picked by Sean, which is I shall be picking Whiplash, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year and is also going to be in theaters on September 20th. You're all welcome. <laughs>